If you want to help out and support the channel, there are a few things you can do. Go check out Flipside Gaming and use the promo code VOIDMAGE in all caps. This will get you 10% off all orders, $10 or more. And if you go shopping on TCGplayer.com, go use my affiliate link in the description below. That way, all purchases you make will go towards helping the channel. And lastly, go check out my Patreon. It's a more direct way that you can help the channel while also getting some more interaction. I appreciate all of your support. If you haven't already, subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss any videos. Hello everyone, welcome back to another Top 10 Commander video. This Top 10 is going to be for Champions of Kamigawa, the set. Champions of Kamigawa is just an incredibly unique set. While it doesn't offer the same kind of power as the Mirrodin block offered or the following Ravnica block would offer, you have one of the more flavorful sets in Magic's history, focusing on a Japanese theme where you would have a war between the living and the spirits. Spirits happen to be one of the main tribes in the entire set. You also saw some wizards, you saw some rats, everybody loves ninjas. Definitely sticks out like a sore thumb when you compare it to other sets. What it does lack in power, it makes up for in synergy. And it really does this by focusing well on the tribes. Again, nothing super powerful, but you do see an emphasis on creature types. Before I start off the top 10, I want to go over some honorable mentions. This set has some very good lands. Hall of the Bandit Lord is a pretty underrated way of giving a creature haste. You are going to end up paying some life to do this, but it helps you out if you don't have a Lightning Grease or a Swiftfoot Boots. If you're playing Voltron, this is just a perfect land. Manamo School at Water's Edge. Very helpful if you have a commander with a a tap ability or just a good legendary creature that happens to tap if you have arcanus the omnipotent that is an activated ability that you could take advantage of being able to tap to draw three more cards doesn't have to be that powerful but you could just simply untap a creature so you can block with it very simple ability but something that is very useful in the format and maronar one of the tribes i mentioned rats rats were ninjas in this set they were actually pretty cool Pretty much Master Splinter. Unfortunately for Kamigawa, you just didn't see that much power. And while it is nice to give all of your rats fear, it does often feel like a poor man's Krenko. The rate that you're capable of getting rats out is inferior to that of goblins. I don't want to say it's not worth building, but rats don't have the kind of power that you expect out of goblins. And neither do goblins, but at least goblins have the speed. Really wish that we had more support for rats. They're just throwaway creatures most of the time. And Goto Bandit Warlord is really powerful with the card Helm of the Host, like so many good legendary creatures are now. But if you wanted to make an all-around equipment deck, Goto is one that I would recommend because he's an equipment tutor, making the aforementioned combo a lot easier. Alright, so going on to number 10 here, Basiju Who Shelters All. This was one of the cards that I experimented with earlier on, just because when I first started playing the game, I ran into a bunch of counter spells and I hated it. And although I don't lean on Basiju in every deck, if I am playing a commander deck that does have as much interaction. I don't have as many ways to respond to my opponents. I at least don't want them to counter everything I have. So if I can protect an instant or sorcery for being countered and I really need an exsanguinate to go off, this is well worth it. It does come into play tapped, so it is a little bit slower. But if you don't have any ways to counter your opponent's counter spells, this is a perfect card. Number nine are the Miogen. My personal favorite is Miogen of Night's Reach, but I also like Life's Web and Seeing Winds. It pretty much comes down to personal preference. They're massive creatures, which means you're probably going to want some way to cheat them into play. Downside to these creatures is that you really can't do that, because then you don't have the divinity counter. You need that divinity counter on them in order to remove it in the first place. There are some ways that you can manipulate that, put more on it later, but for the most part, they're pretty much going to be one-time uses, because their abilities are incredibly powerful. Miogen of Knight's Reach can completely end a game. If your opponents don't have a hand size, and you have pretty much everything you had before, it's going to make it a lot harder for them to get back into the game. While Life's Web can be explosive, you don't know what you could have in your hand, and Seeing Winds can draw you a billion cards. They are pretty expensive though, which does keep them out of a lot of decks. Number 8 is Azami Lady of Scrolls. She actually does bring a lot of power to the tribe she represents. Maronar does something really good for rats. Without Azami though, I don't think wizards are worth playing. If you don't have this way to draw cards, which is incredibly easy, you just don't have the kind of combos you want. I mean, you have some good wizards, but this ability to just tap a wizard, you don't even need any kind of haste enablers because it's just the act of tapping an untapped wizard. You can do this right away as soon as you play her. And of course, yeah, Paradox Engine is gone. It still doesn't stop it from being an incredibly powerful ability. 
Fill your deck with a bunch of wizards, and every one of your turns you're just tapping a few wizards to draw a few cards. And while there isn't Paradox Engine, there is Dramatic Reversal and Isochron Scepter, which is effectively the same thing. You can go infinite, draw your whole deck out, and then Laboratory Maniac like you were going to. Number 7 is the good old Sakura Tribuilder. Doesn't really require much of an explanation. A creature that can pretty much get you whatever basic land you need is going to see a bunch of play. While you do have the downside of not being as effective in mono green, that usually isn't a big problem. People tend to want to play more than one color in Commander. It opens up your strategy, you can do a lot more. And once you get into like 4 or 5 colors, you really need a way to get the specific mana you need. So while it isn't a Birds of Paradise, for a lot of people it's going to offer that versatility in getting you the mana that you need. It also synergizes with sacrifice strategies. So if you have Marin of Clan Neltoth, for instance, any kind of Commander that rewards you for killing your own creatures, or Savra Queen of the Golgari for sacrificing, you're going to play Sakura Tribe Elder because it synergizes with that strategy, not just because it can get you more mana. Number 6 is Azusa Lost But Seeking. Now, we had before this exploration, but getting to play two additional lands each one of our turns is just ridiculous if you can back it up with the card draw. And in Commander, the format that is all about ramp, being able to play her as a commander is just filthy. It opens you up for stacks potential because you can outpace your opponents in that resource. But just any kind of strategy with lands, especially landfall, when you can get multiple land drops a turn, it makes certain things like Omnath Locus of Rage, Obnixilus the Fallen, that much more deadly. One of the few exceptions to Kamigawa being an otherwise relatively weaker set than what preceded it and what eventually followed it, but getting mana does open you up to do even more powerful things. Number 5 is Kikijiki Mirror Breaker. Well known for the combos with cards like Zealous Conscripts, Deceiver Exarch, just any of those creatures that can untap a Kikijiki so that you can use the ability all over again. Probably one of the best red cards in Commander. The possibilities are just endless if you want to fool around with good ETBs, you can do that. If you want to fool around with combat, you can do that as well. It doesn't just have to be about the brutal combos. Later on, we would also get Splinter Twin, which is the enchantment version of this. You just get a lot of utility out of being able to use this ability right away. So if you have a turn where you need to win, the luxury of having Kikijiki means that it's not like other combos where you might need to wait in order to use the ability. If you tooth a nail, Kikijiki, Zealous Conscripts, or whatever creature you want to combo with, that'll work right away. Just an incredibly powerful red creature in the format. And then number four, we have Sensei's Divining Top. Again, in Commander, we're not talking about the most powerful spells. Sensei's Divining Top is just a good quality artifact that isn't really broken in Commander, and a lot of decks just omit it. Because it doesn't really give you card advantage, it just helps you manipulate the top card of your library. So unless your deck is really concerned about that, if you're playing Yannette, Cryptic Sovereign, it might. Sensei's Divining Top, I think, is still important. Keep in mind, it is almost impossible to remove, and and even if your opponents have a Crosin Grip, something that can remove it, they're likely not going to waste it on a Sensei's Divining Top. You get to look pretty much for the rest of the game at the top three cards of your library and decide if there's a card that is absolute crap, you don't have to draw into it if the other two cards are even slightly better. If you really need a land drop and it's turn two, you don't think you're going to make your third land drop, this is a very good card to have. So pretty much, if you can leave that one mana up, you're going to make it so that the next card you draw isn't going to to be the worst card ever because you will at least have two other cards to choose from. If your decks tend to be a bit more inconsistent, this is not the worst card you can just throw in there. If you need a filler card, why not go with it? And number three are the Dragon Spirits. Probably Kokosho the Evening Star if I had to pick a favorite. I also like Yose being able to lock your opponents out of the game. The other three I don't think are too terribly powerful, but not the worst creatures if you need good death triggers. Kokosho just happens to be the best one because you're doing something that is already really powerful in Commander, especially in Black, draining your opponents of life and then gaining that much life. Probably going to end up gaining you 15 life. And of course, with the Dragon Spirits, the best way to play them is to abuse the hell out of them. Bring them back over and over again, kill them off over and over again, get their triggers so that you can keep that pressure on your opponents. And number two is Kodama's Reach. 
pretty much the same reason why you would want to have a Sakura Tribe Elder. I think this is probably even better though, because not only do you get the ability to search up two different basic lands, you could search up a mountain or an island, doesn't have to be a forest, making it perfect for literally any green deck. Why I say you could put it in mono green is because it at least ensures you a following land drop. You get a land straight to the battlefield, and if you still haven't played your land for that turn, you could play the second one. If you already did, you ensure yourself a land drop for the following turn. This is just something that is super important, and yes, there's also Cultivate, but this came out before Cultivate. It is an arcane, but I don't think that's going to be super useful unless we ever return to Kamigawa and fool around with arcanes and spirits. And then number one is Ghostly Prison. The white propaganda. Propaganda technically came first. And while there are some cards, other enchantments in blue that prevent your opponents from attacking or at least discourage them, this seems to be white's thing now. Making your opponents pay attacks if they want to attack you. And a lot of that really started with Ghostly Prison pretty much changing it up ever since we've seen this mostly as a white thing. Sphere of Safety being a very powerful version of this. We've seen Baird to of Argive and Archangel of Tides. Ghostly Prison just happens to be the most flexible while also synergizing with enchantment decks being one of the more popular enchantments you can play. Especially when you consider this a multiplayer format. If there's any way that you can take the pressure off of yourself, you are going to do that. But anyway guys, that's going to do it for this list. Let me know what you think of Champions of Kamigawa. You all have a wonderful day. Void here signing off. See you all next video. Just wanted to say thanks to the patrons who are supporting me on Patreon.com Go check it out. There are different tiers with their own rewards. One of them is having your name in the credits of my videos. I know it's not much, but it's something that I can do to show my appreciation. Thanks again, and have a good day.